Now, in the book of James here in chapter 4, I'm going to be focusing in on the latter part of this chapter. And as everybody here already knows, um, there's been a, a big event that's, that's happened here in the loss of our friend and our brother, Paul. Um, and I kind of, you know, I've, my world's been turned upside down since this happened. And as it happens when anybody loses somebody that's close to them. You lose a family member or a friend and your world gets, gets kind of tossed up in the air and you start thinking about all kinds of different things. And, you know, this scripture came to mind and, and here in James chapter 4, look at verse number 13, we'll start reading again. The Bible says, Go to now, ye that say, Today or tomorrow we will go into such a city and continue there a year and buy and sell and get gain, whereas ye know not what shall be on the morrow. For what is your life? It is even a vapor that appeareth for a little time and then vanisheth away. This is a truth. You know, he's saying, and, and obviously there's, a, there's a, a greater teaching here on what he's trying to tell him. He's explaining like, don't be speaking and boasting of the things of tomorrow and all these great plans you have and all these things you're going to do tomorrow or next year or next week and all these things that you're, you're planning on doing in the future, but you haven't done them yet. He says, you don't know what tomorrow is going to bring. You have no idea what tomorrow is going to be like. We don't know if we're going to, if we're going to see tomorrow. We don't know. It could happen to anybody at any time. It does happen. People pass on from, from infants all the way up to, to people who make it over 100 years old. You never know the day that this is going to happen. It says, what is your life? I says, what is your life? It's even a vapor. And you think about a vapor, it appears just for a real short period of time and it's gone. You think about a boiling water on a stove, sometimes you can see the steam coming up, right? And that steam, it comes up and it's there for just an instant and then it's gone. And that's the descriptive language the Bible is using, saying, you know, that's what our life is like. In the grand scheme of things, in the eternal sense, the years that we have on this life, it's here for a very short time and then vanishes away. Now, I'm deeply saddened by the loss of my friend, but as I mentioned earlier um, in the, the announcement time this morning, you know, praise the Lord that he's saved, and we will see him again. But what I want to focus on today is not so much my friend, but anybody who has this happen. And really, it's just, it's just one of these thoughts that we ought to have and ought to be reoccurring in our life to examine our own life and to stay on track and to stay focused on the things that really matter. Our life is very short. The time that we have here is short. We don't need to be getting distracted with all kinds of other things that can steal our attention away from the things that truly matter. I praise God. I thank God for what, obviously for my salvation. But even after that, for, for bringing my path in line with a good church because I was wasting my life and wasting my years. Yes, I was saved for a long period of time from after I was 20 years old, but doing nothing with my life, wasting my time, wasting my life, drinking, doing other things, just working, even doing things that aren't simple, just, just doing things that ultimately aren't going to matter whatsoever. And if I had continued down that course, at the end of my life, I'd look back and say, what did I even do? What did I accomplish? What did I do with my life? What was my life? My life was a vapor that appeared for a short time and it's gone. We are here for a reason. And it's interesting, we were just talking about this out soul winning today, Brother Sebastian and I. You know, he, he, had, he remembers a conversation he had where you were eight years old, roughly, somewhere in that time period. He was roughly eight years old. And he asked his dad, you know, what's the point? Why are we all here? Why, why are we even, you know, going through this? If we're all going to die, what's the point of being born and living? Now, unfortunately, his dad didn't have a great answer for him. But there is a purpose for our life. God has work for us to do on this life. God has given us tasks and there's things that he wants us and accomplishments he wants us to do to impact other people. One thing, he wants, you know, all things are and were created for his glory, for God. It's, it's for God's pleasure and for God's glory and honor. We were even created and we're even here. We're here to serve God. That is our ultimate purpose. 
Now, there's lots of other things we can do in between, but our goal and our mission here is to please God and to serve God. He's given us a free will. We have the choices to make with our life. And He wants to see if we will voluntarily serve Him and do what's right and, and, and do thing, the things that He has laid out for us to do. He'll give us a plan. He gives us the instructions. And here it is. Here's what I want you to do. It's up to you to do it. And at the end of your life, you're going to realize, hopefully before that, hopefully way before the end of your life, you'll realize that the things that God has laid out for you to do, they are truly the most important things. And those are the things you'll be able to look back on however long we have on this earth. If you were to die tomorrow and you look back on your life, you could say, I actually did things that mattered because I was, I was doing what God had laid out for me to do. Anything else is going to end up being a waste. You think about there's people out there that, that spend all their time, you know, devoted to their family. And hey, I believe in, in having a strong family. But if you don't ever lead your family to Christ, what did you really do? It's a waste. I mean, you, you cared for them. Yeah, great. But, but if, you don't, if you don't teach them about God and about Christ and, and the things that they need to be doing in their life, I mean, even if you devote all your time to them and, and, and spend quality time and do all this other stuff, they're still going to, they, they may just die and go to hell. That's a waste. You can do things that aren't sinful and still end up wasting your life. We need to make sure that we have the right focus. And in order to, to, to do what we need to be doing in this life, we need to prioritize God in our life. We need to make sure and continue to maintain the proper focus in our life. So we don't end up wasting it in the short period of time we have here. Because there is a purpose. A lot of people struggle to find that purpose. And they'll bounce around from different jobs and different spouses and, and different locations geographically. Trying to search and to find out just what is it that, that they're supposed to be doing here. And my friends, it's a lot easier than having to pick up and move places and, and, to, and to do these different jobs. The meaning that we have can be found within the pages of the Bible. And once you get started doing this work, you'll realize how important it really is. The souls of men. It, it's eternal value. And sometimes it takes the passing of a friend or a loved one to even kind of remember that and to have that come back to the forefront. I preached this morning about being faithful and being faithful to friends. I could have been the most faithful friend to my friend and been there for him no matter what. And if I didn't lead him to Christ, what good would it have done him? It would have done no good. Turn, if you would, to Colossians chapter 1. We need to start off making sure that we have God as the priority, as the number one. The, the, when we think about the things that we need to do and we want to get accomplished, whether it be on a daily manner, on a weekly manner, on a lifetime manner, whatever it is, we need to have God as the number one, as that priority in order to, to accomplish anything meaningful. Because as soon as you start putting other things before God, you're going to end up wasting your time. Colossians 1, look at verse 14. Speaking of Jesus Christ, it says, In whom we have redemption through His blood, even the forgiveness of sins, who is the image of the invisible God, the firstborn of every creature. For by Him were all things created that are in heaven and that are in earth, visible and invisible, whether they be thrones or dominions or principalities or powers. All things were created by Him and for Him. Everything that's created was not only created by him, but for him. We were created not only by Jesus Christ, but for Jesus Christ. Verse 17, and he is before all things, and by him all things consist. And he is the head of the body, the church, who is the beginning, the firstborn from the dead, that in all things he might have the preeminence. Jesus Christ should have the preeminence in your life in all things. He needs to be number one. Hey, he's the creator. He's the one who made you to begin with. 
You would think that the one that made you and then not only gave you physical life on this earth, redeemed your soul, redeemed your spirit, and gave you spiritual life. He's given you life twofold. He ought to have the preeminence in our life. We need to make sure that we get that right. And a lot of people do. A lot of people say, yes, you know what? I do want to have God. I love God. And, and without Christ, I am nothing. Nothing. And I want him to be, to have the priority. But how do I go about doing that? And a lot of people will stop right there and just kind of be confused. Well, I don't really know how to do that. How do I make God number one? Turn if you to 1 Corinthians chapter 6. And one of the reasons why a lot of people don't, don't realize that is because they're not reading the Bible for them. They're not reading from God's Word. God's Word, this is, this is what God has given us as instruction and as guidance. And He tells us, He lays it out for us. This is what I want you to do. This is what I have for you to do. This is what I have for you not to do. And if we put God first in our life, we ought to be scouring this book to see what it is that, that he has for us to do. Because it's not that different when you go to, from person to person. The job's basically the same. Just one more evidence, if you, if you haven't been convinced on why we ought to give God the preeminence in everything. Look at 1 Corinthians chapter 6, verse 19. The Bible says, What? Know ye not that your body is the temple of the Holy Ghost which is in you, which ye have of God, and ye are not your own? For ye are bought with a price. Therefore glorify God in your body and in your spirit, which are God's. You, if you're saved this morning, or this evening, you belong to God. You've been purchased. Your body, soul, and spirit has been purchased by God through the blood of Jesus Christ on the cross. He's bought you. You belong to Him. And He has a, a path for you that He wants you to follow. We ought to, therefore, as the Bible says here, glorify God in our body and in our spirit because they belong to God. He's bought us with a price. 2 Corinthians 5.15 says, And that he died for all, that they which live should not henceforth live unto themselves, but unto him which died for them and rose again. This is what he wants. He wants us to live for him, not, un not for ourselves, not for this world's pleasure, not for, for the things that we can accumulate here, but literally to live for God and to devote our lives to serving Him. You don't have to be the pastor of a church to devote your life to serving God. That is not, that is not the only thing, the only position that you can hold in order to serve God. You can faithfully serve God by preaching His Word to everybody you come across without ever having to stand behind a pulpit. And you will be fulfilling the Word of God. Turn if you would to Ephesians chapter number 5. Now this is not an easy thing to do, which is why you don't see people doing this very often. It's difficult to prioritize and have God in your life. It's easy to get distracted with things like going to the lake and going camping and going out and having fun and doing all these other things that can just take up all of our attention. And I'm not saying those things are wicked or bad or wrong and you can never have any form of entertainment or pleasure. But what do you care more about? What's more important to you? Think about those things. What, what do you get excited about? Do you get more excited about, about SeaWorld and, and you know, Six Flags and you know, any amusement parks or whatever, whatever it is? Do you get more excited about those things than you do about, hey, what can I do to serve God? What can I do to reach more people? What can we do to get more people in here and to make this thing succeed and, and work hard for the Lord and get excited about when there's great successes in the house of God? What, what is it? Where is your heart? And that's the ultimate question. Where is your heart? Is the priority on serving God or not? 
Look at Ephesians 5, verse number 14, because in order to do God's will, it's never going to happen just by accident. Don't sit around and wait for something just to fall in your lap or, or someone to just, you know, the perfect opportunity where, where someone's just going to ask you, hey, what, sirs, what must I do to be saved before you ever open up your mouth to preach the gospel? If you want to serve God, you have to make the time to serve Him. It's not easy. We have a lot of things that we need to do. There are responsibilities, especially when you have a family and you have to raise children and you have to provide for that family. There are a lot of things that, that, that require your time. And again, in order to even be in the good graces of God, as I saw as we preached this morning, you know, being faithful to your family. And, and if you don't provide for your own, you're worse than an infidel. So part of obeying and being obedient unto God is working so that you could provide for your family, is raising your children in the nurture and admonition of the Lord, is doing all these things that do require time anyways, but they are in obedience to God's word. But there's more to it than that. Look at verse number 14 of Ephesians chapter 5. The Bible reads, Wherefore he saith, Awake thou that sleepest, and arise from the dead, and Christ shall give thee light. See then that ye walk circumspectly, not as fools, but as wise, redeeming the time, because the days are evil. Wherefore, be ye not unwise, but understanding what the will of the Lord is. And be not drunk with wine wherein is excess, but be filled with the Spirit, speaking to yourselves in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs, singing and making melody in your heart to the Lord. We need to make the time. We need to redeem the time that we have. We need to make the best use of it that we have. Why? Because the days are evil. Why? Because there's a lot of people out there wasting your time. That's why he follows that right up with saying, don't be unwise. Don't be a fool like the fools do that just go out to the bar and get drunk. Hey, it's Friday. Let's go out and party it up and live it up and just have all this fun and end up doing nothing with your life. And actually do even worse because you're sinning and you're going to be looking on strange women and, and speaking perverse things because you're drunk. And for a long time, I had a life of vanity like that. That was, that was spent doing nothing else but just going from the next feel-good session to the next feel-good session and just focus on me and, and having fun with my friends and accomplishing zero with my life. Wasting time. Turn, if you would, to Philippians chapter 4. Philippians chapter 4. Sometimes it can be... You decide, you know what? I do, I do prioritize God first. I do care about the things of God. And I do want, I want to do that work. And I am going to make time for it. I am going to make sure I read my Bible. I am going to make sure I, I go out and win souls. I am going to make sure I come to church. I am going to make sure I do as much as I can. But when it comes to doing a real serious work, a lot of people get afraid. And it's time to lose your fears if you really want to go to the next level in serving God and walk by faith and not by sight. Look at Philippians 4, verse number 6. Verse number 6 of Philippians 4 reads, Be careful for nothing. But in everything, by prayer and supplication, with thanksgiving, let your requests be made known unto God. And the peace of God, which passeth all understanding, shall keep your hearts and minds through Christ Jesus. The Bible says be careful for nothing. It means you don't have to be so, you know, so careful where you end up not doing anything. So don't, don't worry about that. And you know, what, what oftentimes we get too careful with things is because you're afraid, because you're fearful. You don't know what's going to happen. You know, I praise the Lord. We're gonna, we have a family that's moving out here that is taking this step of faith where the husband doesn't even have a job lined up, but they know through a lot of prayer, through reading, through, through talking, that, that they need to do something with their life. They need to make a change. And they have decided what is our priorities. And I just spoke with this gentleman on the phone yesterday and, and he was explaining to me their process and it's an excellent process. And he said, they, they talked it over, him and his wife talked about it. Well, what is our ultimate goal? Because where they're at right now, it's real comfortable because they'll have family, they have other support, they have people there that they know and that they love. And it's, it's comfortable to be there. It's a lot easier 
to just say, well, we, we'll be okay here. But they said, we know what our priority is. Our priority right now is that, is that we can do a great work for God, that we really want to be in His service, and we want to walk by faith and, and, and not worry about, about the fears of, of what if this and what if that. And they have the true faith that, you know what? From everything that they see and everything that they know, it, that they want to be used of God. And they feel hindered where they're at right now. They're not able to be used to their full potential. And they're going to, get, they're going to actually move and get plugged in, even though that may be scary for a lot of people. To not know, to have a family, and, and to not know, well, where's, you know what's going to happen when I get there. The job market isn't that great. Hey, God, they, you know what, though? Praise the Lord. They've got faith that God is going to watch out for them. Now, the man's a hard worker. He's going to be looking for work immediately. And you know what? People like that, he's going to find a job anyways. And I know God's going to bless him. But when you are, are a go-getter, when you're not willing to just sit at home and, and sit on your couch and do nothing, and when you just get up and, and get hustling and get moving, you're going to find work. There's always work for people who are willing to do the work. But the people that want to be lazy and maybe look online for an hour, eh, okay, well, I can't find nothing. Yeah, that person isn't going to find a job. But the Bible says, be careful for nothing. But in everything, by prayer and supplication, we need to be going to God first, obviously, which is exactly the, the whole process he described to me of what they're doing, you know, praying to God, speaking it over, and understanding the costs and what they're going to be facing, and knowing that, hey, it may not be that easy when we get out there, and knowing that, hey, we, it might be very difficult, and just even knowing that in advance is enough to strengthen you when the time comes so that you're not just taken aback. You know, a lot of people get real emotional and excited right off the bat. You know, people sometimes get saved. They're like, oh, man, this is awesome. Let's go out and win someone in Christ and do all this, and then they get a setback, right? There's, there's an obstacle in their path. And they're not really rooted and founded, and they're acting a little bit more impulsively. And then all of a sudden, you know, one, the, the first bad thing to happen or the first persecution they face, it ends up knocking them out. But in order for our lives to be meaningful, we can't be like that, like the Roman candle Christian that just is real bright and shoots off, but then it just fizzles out after a really short period of time. We need to be a, a, an oak tree. We need to be founded and grounded and rooted and unmovable and steadfast in our faith. Turn forward to 2 Timothy chapter 1. 2 Timothy chapter 1. It's a shorter sermon tonight, but it's a real simple topic. And I think we need to, to evaluate ourselves from time to time and just make sure we are putting the most important things first, not third, not fourth. You say, well, God's in my life. You know, I still go to church. But where does he land in your life? Is it number five? Jesus Christ ought to have the preeminence in everything. 2 Timothy chapter 1, look at verse number 7. The Bible reads, For God hath not given us the spirit of fear, but of power and of love and of a sound mind. Be not thou therefore ashamed of the testimony of our Lord, nor of me as prisoner, but be thou partaker of the afflictions of the gospel according to the power of God, who hath saved us and called us with an holy calling, not according to our works, but according to his own purpose and grace, which was given us in Christ Jesus before the world began. The biggest way that you can serve God, and probably the best way, is to win souls to Christ. That's ultimately the goal. Is, you know, when we get sin out of our lives, it's so that we can be used even more. We have a more solid testimony. We're, we, you know, we, we're able, we'll be able to understand more of the Bible because we're, we're listening and receiving what he says and he's going to continue to build upon that and say, oh, okay, you've learned that. Here, I'll give you something else to learn. I mean, you, you know what he could just absorb everything all at once. And God knows this and we know this. And the more that we continue to do what's right, God will use us more and more and say, wow, this vessel is, is becoming very useful. This is this 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 is you know this person is becoming very useful and very good. I'm going to start sending him off. He's becoming very faithful and much more meat for the master's use. 
to be used to do greater things of God. So that's the end of, of all the, you know, you know, preaching hard on the, on the sins and getting ourselves right with God in that sense, but the ultimate goal so that we can be used to the utmost to reach the most people and to bring them to Christ also. And we ought never to be ashamed of the gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ. The, the, the person, the, the Jesus Christ that saved you from your sins when you were headed towards hell. To have this spirit of fear and not want to open up your mouth to preach the gospel to somebody because you're afraid of what they might say or think or do and end up bringing shame upon the gospel because you're afraid to preach to somebody. And this is such a huge setback in so many Christians' lives of not being willing to go out and talk to other people because they're afraid. My question to you is, what are you afraid of? Literally, what are you afraid of? People have been doing, I've been doing this for years and years. I'm still walking around. I've never, I've never had any problems happen. But even if problems were to arise, even if someone were to beat me up, literally, what, what's... What's the worst that could happen? I mean, look at what happened to the apostles. Look at what happened to other people that served Christ. They went through some serious afflictions, but did they stop? No, they kept going. They counted it all joy. They actually leapt for day. They jumped out and yeah! We're doing something right! After they got beat and told not to preach about Jesus Christ. And we have Christians in America that are too afraid to open up their mouth and just, and just preach about Jesus because they've been brainwashed into thinking that there's some things you just don't talk about, religion and politics, it's taboo. You can't talk about that because it upsets people. Well, you know what? I don't care. If, if the gospel of Jesus Christ upsets people, then people are going to be getting upset. But nobody is going to say, you never told me. Why didn't you ever tell me about that? Why didn't you ever tell me that I can be saved from, from the eternity of hell? How would, you like, how would you like to be faced with somebody that, someone that you know going to hell? And I'm not saying this would happen, but just, just imagine this event happening where, where for some reason they were able to talk to you and say, hey, you're in heaven and they're in hell. And they say, why didn't you tell me about this place? Well, how stupid would you feel to say, well, I didn't want to upset you? As they're burning in hell and just looking at you saying, why? Why didn't you just tell me how easy it is to get saved? I would have listened to you. Well, you, you kind of, uh, I didn't want to upset you. you know, those are things I didn't think you wanted to talk about. And it'll come back to your own fear or your own shame of the gospel of Jesus Christ. Don't let that fear prevent you from doing something meaningful with your life and having an impact on the eternal destination of a soul. I'm not looking forward to speaking in front of, a, in front of the, the family and friends of my friend. That, that the past, it's, not, it's not something that's enjoyable. But I'll tell you what, it's, it's definitely manageable and a lot, a lot better than had the result been different. Had he not gotten saved. I don't know how I would deal with that. That is a tragedy. That would be a tragedy and, and, and just... How, do you, how, would you, how would you cope? And see, too often... Too often we spend our days thinking, well, this isn't quite the right opportunity. Well, there will be a better chance some other time. You don't always know what tomorrow is going to bring. And for me, this is, this is just, these events that happened to me last, this, the past week, it's just one more reminder of that. So, you know, Someone you could talk to the day before, the next day you might never end up speaking to again because they've passed on. We have to keep that in our memory. It's easy to, to get caught up into this way of thinking that 
things will continue on the way they are. And of course, everyone's going to live until their 70s or 80s. And then they're going to die of natural causes. That's what everybody thinks. That's what I think about myself. That's what I think about my wife. But we don't know that. We have no idea. No idea. We need to, to redeem the time that we have today. Redeem the time that you have when you are with that person. Now, some, I'm not saying people are just going to get it and get saved right away. They may need you to bring it up over and over and over again. But bring it up over and over and over again. You don't know when it might be the last time you have to bring it up to them. And I guarantee you, you'll be, you will be in really bad shape for yourself if you, if you have a heart when a friend or loved one that you've had opportunities to share the gospel with and you never did, ends up passing away. Turn, if you would, to Philippians chapter 3. It's the last place we'll look tonight. We need to view our days as our individual days. When you wake up, hey, praise God, he's given you another day. How are you going to serve him today? Every day you wake up, how are you going to serve God today? What are you going to do? And the, the great thing about a new day, you wake up with your life. You can forget about the things in the past. It's already done. Nothing you can do to change the past at all. Bible says in Philippians 3, verse 13, Brethren, I count not myself to have apprehended, but this one thing I do, forgetting those things which are behind and reaching forth unto those things which are before, I press toward the mark for the prize of the high calling of God in Christ Jesus. Oftentimes people will, will let things that they have done in the past get them out of church. And, and, and way too often, I've seen this happen in church, someone will get involved in some sin. Some bad thing. Maybe someone will go off and get drunk or do something that they're totally ashamed of. And they're so ashamed that they feel like they can't show their, their face up now in church again. And, they, and then all of a sudden you just, they drop out and you don't see them anymore. That is the wrong course of action to take. Now, should you grieve and be ashamed to be sorrowful over, over sins that you commit? Yeah, of course. But let that, that sorrow turn to repentance and not to a, to a hopeless heart that thinks that you can't show up in church again. Absolutely, you should show up and, and do the right thing. And don't, continue, don't, don't add sin upon sin and forsake the assembling of yourselves together just because you've done something bad. Look, we need to be able to get past those things that we've done and press toward the mark. And you know what? You're running a race. If you trip and stumble and fall down flat on your face... Hey, at least get back up and finish the race. Keep moving forward. Don't just lay in the ditch and just lay there and, and, and have a pity party for yourself. Get up and keep going because as soon as you stop and you stagnate, you're not going to accomplish anything anymore. You're not going to do anything. We need to make sure we're doing stuff. Look at verse number 20, Philippians 3. The Bible says, For our conversation is in heaven. From whence also we look for the Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ, who shall change our vile body that it may be fashioned like on his glorious body, according to the working whereby he is able even to subdue all things unto himself. Look how it started off, verse 20. For our conversation is in heaven. Where is your conversation today? Is it in heaven? Do you talk about the things of God? Are you, are you focused on heaven and, and, and the rewards and people getting to heaven? Or are you just, is, your, is your conversation in the Super Bowl? Is your conversation just in the things of this world and in, and in making money and in every other possible distraction you might possibly have in this world? If your life ended today and you were face to face with the Lord, would He say to you, Well done, thou good and faithful servant. Think about that. Think about what you've done with your life up to this point. And you, and you breathe your last breath. And now you're facing God. 
And you have, you have no more opportunity. You know, the things like, you know what? I was going to I was gonna go do more soul winning. I was waiting for my kids to grow up. I was waiting for them to get out of the house. And then I could devote more time. And then I was really going to help people out. And then I was really going to do things for God. I was waiting to just retire from my job and to get all set. And then I would have all this time. And then I was going to serve the Lord. You don't know what tomorrow is going to bring. Don't be planning on serving God in the future. If you died today, would God be pleased with the service that you've done for him? If not, and maybe, maybe so, hey, praise the Lord. If you think that's, you know what, I am doing a good job. And, and I think the people of the church do do a good job. But this is something we need to be continually reminding ourselves of and asking ourselves, would God be pleased with the work that I've done for him? We don't know the day or the hour of any, anyone's death, anyone's passing. It's going it to happen at any moment for anybody, unlike the rapture. I've heard people say, you know, things, like, and I don't remember the exact phrase, but like, you know, like to live your life as if, you know, it's like your last day or whatever, right? Whatever, all these, these phrases out there so that you could, you know, the, the, the goal is to live life to its fullest, right? But I, I don't like that phrase as much that it's, Focusing more on yourself, the way that they phrase these things. You know, do the things that you would do and, and live like, like you're not going to have a tomorrow. Um, I, would, I would probably modify that a little bit to live like it's everyone else's last day. I think that would be a much more productive way to live, eternally speaking than just living as if it's your last. Because if it's your last day, you're going to be thinking about what are the things that I really want. And that would be gratifying for me to do today because I might not wake up tomorrow. But what if you thought of, this may be the last time I see Brother Sebastian. This may be the last time I see, you know, see anybody. Is there something that you've just been meaning to do and just never doing? Are there, uh, is there someone that you've been meaning to give the gospel to and you just haven't? I think that's a much better philosophy on, on how we ought to, to look at things. Hey, what, what if I never saw this person again? Seize every opportunity that you have to preach the gospel is what it boils down to. Put God first in your life. Don't let fears rule what you do. Have the faith that, that you're going to do what, what God's laid out for you to do. And don't ever miss an opportunity to preach the gospel and to get somebody saved. Let's pray. Dear Heavenly Father, Lord, we thank you so much for the instruction that you give us, the simple instruction in your word, dear Lord. We thank you for giving us the ministry of reconciliation, of bringing people to Christ, dear Lord, and, and giving us that honor of that task, dear Lord. But it is work. Help us understand that and help us to not get so caught up with every other thing that we can possibly do in this life before we, before we consider you and what you have for us to do. Dear Lord, if there's, if there's a short amount of time that we have things to do, let's put you first. And there is a short period of time. Our, our life is but a vapor, dear Lord. It appears and then it vanisheth away. I pray that you would please help us to make the best use of the time that we have here and that we would have our priorities set so much that we would make the time to, to make sure that we're serving you and that we're doing the things that would be pleasing in your sight, dear God. And I pray that you would please help us all to have the boldness that we need and the confidence to, to preach your word, dear God, and to preach the gospel unto everybody, unto those that we come into contact with, and, and that we should have no fear or, or regret or, or doubt in whether or not we should actually talk to somebody about Christ. Or we don't know when we may see these people again, if ever. Pray that you please strengthen us and, and help us to maintain the proper focus in our life. In Jesus' name we pray, amen.